<clears throat> Hello and welcome to lecture 10 for the course ECE 252B, Computer Arithmetic, uh, for spring quarter 2020. Uh, this lecture deals with chapter 12 in the textbook entitled Variations in Multipliers and it's the last of four chapters dealing with uh, multiplication algorithms and hardware designs. Beginning next time we switch to the next major arithmetic operation which is division. So in this chapter, I've collected uh, a number of uh, miscellaneous methods. Basically, everything else we need to know about multiplication besides uh, the basics in chapter 9, high radix multiplication in chapter 10, and tree and array multipliers in chapter 11. Okay, the first uh, topic in this chapter is uh, divide and conquer, also known as recursive designs. So recursive designs or divide and conquer design basically utilize smaller multipliers to build up larger ones. Uh, just as you can build, uh, say, a 16-bit adder from two 8-bit adders, or from three 8-bit adders and some uh, multiplexers in the case of carry select adders. You can build, let's say, a 16-bit multiplier from 8-bit multipliers, and then the 8-bit multipliers from 4-bit multipliers, and so on. You can proceed recursively until you get to very small multipliers, maybe 2 by 2, that can be directly synthesized as logic circuits. So the diagram you see on the left uh, on this slide uh, shows the basics of um, multiplying two numbers A and X by dividing them into two parts, the lower half of A, the upper or the higher part of A, the lower half of X and the higher half of X. And then multiplying these shorter numbers, half-length numbers, so XL times AL is this number, AL times XL, AH times XL is this number, AL times XH is this number, and finally AH times XH is this number. And the shifts, uh, basically, are appropriate for the respective weights. So these two are basically aligned with the right half, their weight 1. So that's why the product, the double width product of these two, starts at the right end. This one starts in the middle. So when multiplied by AL, the product starts in the middle. Similarly, AH times XL. And because both of these AH and XH start in the middle, let's say if this is uh, K over 2 bits, then this one starts from K bits to the left. So we need to add these four partial products to form the final product P. So if we are given these half-width multipliers, we need four of them to form these. And then we need to do this four operand addition. So this is, in fact, not a four operand addition, but a three operand addition, because ALXL does not overlap with AHXH. They have no overlap bits. So this is depicted in the diagram on the right, AL, XL, and AH, XH do not overlap, so they're considered as just one very long number. 
AHXL and ALXH, these two, do overlap with each other and with this longer number. <clears throat> so looking at these three things that need to be added, we know this, that, so I'm assuming in this diagram that these are B bit multipliers, and I'm trying to build a 2B by 2B multiplier from B by B multipliers. So the rightmost B bits of the product is directly obtained from here. I don't need to do any additional processing. Then I need to do carry save addition in these 2 bit, 2 B bit positions. And then finally, I have to add the resulting two numbers using a 3 bit. 3b bit adder. <clears throat> so the multiplier of this kind starts with four half width multipliers to form these four numbers. And then a carry save adder of this width in order to reduce the three operands to two operands. And finally, a 3b bit adder to add these numbers. <clears throat> and this idea can be extended. So in order to build a 2B by 2B multiplier, I need these four partial products obtained by B by B multipliers. Now, if I want to do 3B by 3B, triple the width. So I have 8-bit multipliers. I want to build 24-bit multiplier. Then I need nine of these smaller multipliers with their outputs aligned as shown in this colored portion of this diagram. And finally, if I want to build 4B by 4B multiplier, like going from 8 to 32 bits, then I need 16 partial products to be formed. In the case of doubling the width of the multiplier, I have three things to add. In the case of tri tripling, I need five bits to add, five things to add. And in the case of quadrupling the width, I have seven things to add, okay? So in the case of these seven things, I need seven two counters, let's say, to reduce these seven numbers to two numbers before adding them. So notice that I need more of those smaller multipliers than I would in going from a k-bit adder to a 2k-bit or a b-bit adder to a 2b-bit adder. In the case of adders, I need either two adders cascaded together or three adders if I use the carry select design. But here, doubling the word requires four of those smaller multipliers. Okay, and tripling requires nine. Okay, so in the previous discussion, I assumed that the component multipliers, the smaller multipliers that I use, are square multipliers, B by B bits. Um, there's no reason for component multipliers to be square. They can be rectangular. So for example, if I want to build an 8 by 8 multiplier using 2 by 4 component multipliers, I can do it. And then the alignment of these partial products that I add will be a little bit different in a non-square component multipliers. In particular here, you see that the height of this matrix is 7 when I quadruple the width. In this case, the height of the matrix is less than 7 because this number up here and this number have no overlap. 
Okay, so it's actually six in this example. So instead of using B by B component multipliers, I use B by C. B and C can be different numbers. So basically, that corresponds doubling, doubling the width in each component. So b by c becomes 2b by 2c. Those are these four partial products. And you see that the height is 3 in this example. So I need three two counters. Okay, if I want to do 2b by 4c, in other words, double the width in this component and quadruple the width in this component, then I get basically these, the, let's say the lower half of these partial products. And in this case, I don't really need five to two counters because again, there's no overlap between this one at the very top. So imagine just the lower half of this diagram. And there is no overlap between that one and this one or this one. So the height will not be five Depends, of course, on the B and C values. The closer B and C are together, the closer we get to this square situation. But if B and C are quite different, then this matrix will be sort of skewed, and some of the overlaps will be eliminated. Okay, as, as, as I mentioned before, we need these smaller component multipliers, but also some adders. So in this uh, small example, I've shown how you can go from 4x4 four four multipliers, so these boxes up there are 4x4 four four multipliers, to an 8x8 eight eight multiplier. So I need four of those component multipliers. So this one takes bits 0 to 3 of x and a. This one takes bits 0 to 3 of x and bits 4 through 7, the upper half of a, and so on. Upper half of x, lower half of a, and then upper half of both a and x. And then basically the output of each of these 4-bit multipliers is an 8-bit number. And for ease of discussion, I've divided this 8-bit uh, output into its lower half, bits 0 through 3, and its upper half. Similarly, when I multiply these two, the lower half goes from bits 4 through 7, and the upper half 8 through 11. And then notice that I'm using 4-bit adders here. I'm not using any carry safe addition. Just suppose, you know, I have components that are 4-bit adders and 4-bit multipliers. How do I build an 8x8 eight eight multiplier? So basically, I have to reduce these using just 4-bit adders. So I can apply a 4-bit adder there, which gives me a 5-bit output. And then all the remaining dots that you see there, still unprocessed. So those unprocessed dots are brought forward. Then I use another 4-bit adder, combining these 4 bits. Remember, the red dots are outputs of that 4-bit adder. So this 4-bit adder generates these five dots. So that's basically the second adder here. Then I bring the rest of the dots down. Oh, sorry. I also apply another 4-bit adder here 
two four bit numbers and I use this one as carry in to this four bit adder. So that's this adder. Two four bit numbers coming in and the carry in, which is the carry out of that first addition there. So these are the outputs of these two adders. And again, the leftover dots. I apply another 4-bit adder. And this is that adder over here. Carry in comes from this adder. And then finally, I bring everything down. And so notice that these uh, These eight bits over here are single bits, so they're already in final form. These four bits, four of the red dots, are also single bits. So I need to somehow reduce these. And I apply a four bit adder there, in which one input is a four bit number. Okay, one input is a 4-bit number. Uh, one input is a 1-bit number. So that's the 1-bit number. And carry in, that comes from this adder. Okay, so here I'm using only 4x4 four four multipliers and 4-bit adders to synthesize an 8 by 8 multiplier. Of course, this is not the fastest design because I could have used carry save addition in this process to reduce these numbers faster. Uh, as drawn here, the latency through this part of the design, the addition part, consists of one 4-bit adder, a second 4-bit adder, a third 4-bit adder, and then a fourth. There are four 4-bit adders on the critical path. So it's not particularly fast, but it has the advantage of using just standard components, 4x4 four four multipliers and 4-bit adders. OK, this leads us into the discussion of Karatsuba multiplication. Karatsuba is the person who first thought of this uh, basically optimization of recursive multiplication. So recursive multiplication basically takes two numbers, divides each of them in half, and then does multiplication of the various components, four multiplications, low by low, high by low, low by high, and high by high. So those are the four multiplications, AHXH, AHXL, ALXH, and ALXL. These two, low by high and high by low, are multiplied by 2 to the B, are shifted to the left by B bits. And high multiplied by high is shifted to the left by 2 B bits. So we are essentially evaluating this expression that requires four multiplications and a bunch of additions. One addition, two additions, three additions. OK, now Karatsuba observed that we can rewrite that expression up there. So the product of these two numbers, A which is its high part multiplied by 2 to the b plus its low part, x, which is its high part multiplied by 2 to the b plus its low part, like this. So this is basically the same expression. I have 2 to the 2b ahxh as up there. A 2 to the b ahxl, which appears up there too, 2 to the b ALXH, that's already up there. I have 2 to the B AH XH that does not appear 
in that expression. So I subtract that extra term. And then to the B A L X L, I subtract that one as well. So that I, the result corresponds to that. And then A L X L, the last term, appears here. Okay, now this expression, if you look at it carefully, involves three multiplications. One, ALXL, two, AHXH, and three, which is the sum of AHXL, AL, multiplied by the sum of XH and XL. So it reduces the number of multiplications from four to three, but it also increases the number of additions needed. Okay, how many additions? One, two, three, four, five, six. So instead of three additions up there, I have six additions, but one fewer multiplication. So under conditions where multiplication is much slower than addition, this trade-off is worthwhile. Increase the number of additions and reduce the number of multiplications. Okay, let's say addition is basically free. It takes zero time, okay, just for the sake of argument. Then this recursive solution in each unrolling uh, triples the number of multiplications. So basically, If you unroll this uh, five times, the ratio of the number of multiplications is four thirds to the five, which is a little bit over four. So I need four times fewer multiplications. If you unroll it 10 times, then I need about 18 times fewer multiplications. You unroll it 20 times, more than 300 times, advantage in terms of number of multiplication. If you unroll 50 times, the advantage becomes huge. So this algorithm is particularly suitable when you multiply very long numbers. Okay, and this is, for example, encountered in uh, applications of uh, cryptography, where you have very long numbers that you need to multiply. And for those long numbers, if you use this recursive scheme, you do a lot of unrolling before you get to very short multipliers, okay? And therefore, it gives you a lot of advantage in uh, reducing the number of multiplications. Basically, on long numbers, multiplication is a quadratic operation. <clears throat> Because if you're multiplying two 1,000 digit numbers, you need 1 million digit multiplication. It's quadratic. Whereas if you're adding two 1,000 digit numbers, that's linear. You need to do 1,000 digit additions, with carries, of course, propagate. OK, so the complexity of multiplication grows quadratically, whereas addition grows linearly. That's why this trade-off proposed by Karatsuba uh, is helpful in reducing uh, the complexity of multiplication. Now, theoretically, uh, the computational uh, complexity of multiplication uh, until 2007, uh, Shonich and Volker Strassen's uh, algorithm using FFT was the best known algorithm. It had an order log k time complexity, an order k log k log log k circuit complexity or hardware complexity. Okay, since the early days of uh, people studying multiplication, they had a suspicion, they had a suspicion that this should be reducible to k log k. So we should be able to eliminate this log log k term from here, but nobody knew how to do it. 
But even if we remove this term, notice that these lower bounds, log k latency and k log k uh, hardware complexity, suggest that multiplication is a more difficult operation than addition. Because in addition, we could achieve log k latency and linear order k cost. But here we cannot achieve linear cost. We do have the logarithmic latency, which means asymptotic, asymptotically multiplication is as fast as addition, but it's a much more complex uh, in term, it's much more complex in terms of circuitry. Now, in 2007, uh, Führer managed to replace the log log k term with an asymptotically smaller term, but still, he could not eliminate that term completely. It reduced its size to a non-constant term that grows much more slowly than log log k. And at this point, the state of knowledge is such that we probably cannot, nobody has proven it, but we probably cannot design linear complexity, linear cost multipliers. Just last year, David Harvey and Joris van der Hoven developed an order k log k multiplication algorithm. So they basically solved the open problem of whether we can remove this term log log k completely. But theirs was a theoretical study. In other words, their, their study does not lead to practical multiplication algorithm for the usual reason that you know, order k log k is not practically advantageous if it comes with a huge constant in front of it. So this log log k grows pretty slowly so that even if k is, let's say, 1,000, log of 1,000 is about 10 in base 2, and log of 10 is about 4. Okay, so if there's a constant in front of k log k that is maybe 100 or 200, then k log k cannot compete with this one with a smaller constant in front of it. Okay, but theoretically the problem is, has been resolved, and we do have order k log k complexity multipliers with order log k time. Okay, now the second topic that I will discuss in this lecture is the notion of additive multiply modules. So what is an additive multiply module? Schematically, it is shown in the diagram on the left. So there's a box that receives A in this example 4 bits and X in this example 2 bits. So these are called the multiplicative inputs. So A is multiplied by X. That's why they're called the multiplicative inputs. And there are two additive inputs, Y and Z. And this box computes A times X plus Y plus Z. A times X, the two multiplicative inputs are multiplied. And then the two additive inputs are added. So this box multiplies but also adds some terms to the results of the multiplication. Why is such a box useful? First of all, before discussing why it's useful, how would I go about implementing this? Well, here is the 2 by 4 multiplication, these two rows of dots. Here is the 4-bit additive input, y. And here's the 2-bit additive input. So my task is to add all of these together. The two partial products, 
resulting from multiplying x by a, so basically x0 times a plus 2 times x1 times a, those are the two, then the 4-bit additive input and the 2-bit additive input. So because I have multi-operand addition, I apply a carry save adder at first. So three bits combined by a full adder, three bits, and so on. And then at this point, all I need is a four-bit adder, including a carry in, to complete the process. So this uh, additive multiply module is only slightly more complex than a multi because a multiplier would need these two terms, okay, and it would need this four bit adder in order to add those two. So the only thing this additive multiply module has, in addition to forming these two partial products and then adding them, is just this carry save addition at the beginning. So it's both not much slower and not much more complex than a simple two by four multiplier. So more generally, this is B bits wide, this is C bits wide, this is B bits wide, this is C bits wide, and then this is B plus C bits wide. And it's easy to verify that A times X, B bit times C bits, plus a b bit number plus a c bit number is representable in b plus c bits and this equality shows to the b minus 1 times to the c minus 1 is the maximum product of these two to the b minus 1 is the maximum value of this b bit number and to the c minus 1 is the maximum value of the c bit number and if you simplify, you get 2 to the b plus c minus 1, which means it is representable in b plus c bits. So this additive multiply module is not much slower. It's not much more complex than just a b by c multiplier. It also does not need additional output lines. It has the same number of output lines as a b by c multiplier. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, here I've shown an 8 by 8 multiplier built of 2 by 4 additive multiply modules. So notice that there are 8 additive multiply modules of the type shown here and nothing else. Remember, when we did recursive multiplication, we needed those small multipliers, but we also need adders. Well, because the addition capability is built into this module, I can basically use that addition capability so that only eight 2 by 4 additive multiply modules are needed to build this 8 by 8 multiplier. Okay, so basically to understand this, this is the lowest two bits of x, this is the lowest four bits of a, so a is being divided into two four bit parts and x is divided into four two bit parts because we have two by four multipliers. So the lowest x bits multiplied by the lowest a bits. And the output will be 6 bits wide, which I divide into a 2-bit portion and a 4-bit portion. This 2-bit portion drops out, becomes part of the final product, as the 4-bit portion is added into this module. And this star means this input is unused. This additive input is unused. So a 2-bit number is multiplied by a 4-bit number, and this additive input, 4-bit additive input is added. The 2-bit additive input is unused. I get a 6-bit. So if you trace the, the weights of these bits, you will recognize that this is 
correctly multiplying the two numbers and eventually at the very end you get the 16-bit product so 2 bits plus 2 bits plus 2 bits plus 2 bits so this is the lower 8 bits 2 bits here and then 6 bits here so that's 16 bits altogether so in dot notation what is happening in this design is shown here I'll just explain a little bit of this and let leave it up to you to sort of establish the correspondence between this design and this dot notation representation. So that's the 2 by 4 additive multiply module up there in which both additive inputs are unused. And that corresponds to processing these dots. Basically a 2 by 4 multiplication. That leads to six bits at the output, and then everything else is transferred down here. Then we apply these two additive multiply modules, and those are shown here. One of them actually is used as just a plain two by four multiplier. It is this one, where the additive inputs are not used. One of them actually does have a four bit additive input. So this is so that these enclosed boxes basically tell me which dots are being processed. So this corresponds to this top box. These two correspond to these two boxes. In the next level, two additive multiply modules here. One of them has both a 4-bit and a 2-bit additive input. It is this one. And one of them just has a 4-bit additive input, no 2-bit additive input, and that's this one. Again, go further down. This corresponds to this additive multiply module over here. Go down. This box corresponds to this additive multiply module. And this final box corresponds to this one. And I have my 16-bit product. Now this is another way of connecting those. So notice that in this design the connections are rather irregular. Notice that on the first level there's one box, then two boxes in the next two levels, then one box in each of the last three levels. So it's not completely irregular. This is completely regular in terms of layout and therefore it's uh, pretty good for VLSI realization because if you say lay out this top part of the circuit, this one, these two boxes, then you just replicate it four times to get the entire circuit. And the downside, the drawback of this design is that the critical path increases. Uh, so if you trace signals, Okay, so signals, let's say, start here. This one goes there. So this one is on the critical path. Then it goes here. This one is on the critical path. Then this signal goes here. So all eight logs are on the critical path. So it's slower than this design, the previous design, where the critical path goes through one, two, three, four, five, six of these boxes. There is some parallelism between these two boxes and these two boxes. Okay, now those unused, uh, it's easier to do it with this diagram. Let's look at those unused additive inputs. So here's an unused additive input, 4 bits. Here is an unused additive input, 4 bits. Together, they can be used to input an 8-bit number. And then here is a 2-bit additive input, 2-bit, 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 unused. And they're in different weight positions. So collectively, they too represent an 8-bit number. 
So basically, I can input an 8-bit number through these inputs and another 8-bit number through these inputs and turn this design into an additive multiply module for 8 by 8, 8-bit 8 and 8-bit operands. Okay, so that's nice because now I can use that 8 by 8 additive multiply module to synthesize larger multipliers, perhaps 8 by 16 or 16 by 16. So I can recursively apply the same principle by turning these designs into additive multiply modules. Uh, I can basically build larger and larger multipliers using the same principle. Okay, the next topic uh, that we will discuss is bit serial multipliers. Remember, bit serial adders are extremely simple. All you need is to have a full adder and a carry flip-flop, and then just feed the two numbers into this box, starting from the least significant bit, and then the output emerges starting from the least significant bit. So x0 and y0 come in first, s0 is generated, x1 and y1 come next, s1 is generated, and so on. And what we need inside the box is just a full adder and a carry flip-flop. Now, the natural question is, can we do the same thing for a multiplier? In other words, can I design a bit serial multiplier in which the inputs come in one bit at a time, beginning with the least significant position. And the output is generated, again, beginning with the least significant position. What goes inside this box? It turns out that we can design such a bit serial multiplier, but the complexity inside the box is ex significantly more than what we have for a bit serial adder. And the intuition behind us being able to do this is that the least significant bit of the product is a function only of a0 and x0. Okay, if you look at the dot notation representation of multiplication, you see very easily that p0 is just a function of a0 and x0. P1 is just a function of A0, X0, A1, X1. So by the time we receive A1 and X1, we should be able to produce P1 and so on. So theoretically, it's feasible to do this bit serial multiplication, although we don't know at this time what should go inside this box. Okay. So before revealing that answer, let me tackle a related problem in which I do multiplication in which one operand comes in bit serially, one bit per clock tick, beginning at the low, lowest bit, least significant bit. The other operand comes in in parallel. In fact, this is a very useful circuit when you try to multiply an incoming bit serial input by a constant that is stored in a register, or one of several constants that are stored in memory, and then you fetch the appropriate constant from that memory, and then you try to multiply that constant by this uh, bit serial input x, okay? And this design does that. This is basically a carry save adder. Okay, in disguise, it doesn't look like a carry save adder. So what happens basically, x0 comes in, is kept in this flip-flop or latch. Then it is multiplied by a through these AND gates. So the outputs of those AND gates represent x0 times a. Basically, they're either all zeros, if x0 happens to be 0, or they're a copy of A if X0 happens to be 1. Okay, 
then that number is added to a carry save number. So this particular bit of the number is added to these two. And the result is stored as a carry save number. This is the sum bit, and this is the carry bit. Now, because before processing the next bit, we have to right shift this carry save number, instead of keeping the sum bit in this position and sending the carry to the next higher position, we implement the right shift directly by sending the sum bit to the next lower position and keeping the carry bit. So the carry bit should go here, but then it's immediately right shifted. So the carry bit is kept in position. And then this is the one bit of the product that is generated per clock cycle. So initially x0 comes in, addition takes place, and the lower, lowest order bit of the product sits in this register. In the next cycle, we read out this lowest bit and then compute the next bit and so on. So with one cycle, one clock cycle delay, the output will emerge. All the bits of the output come from this flip-flop. So this is a serial parallel multiplier. One input is serial, one input is parallel. Now there's a problem with this design. If A is a wide number, let's say a 64-bit number, I basically have a fan-out problem here because this signal goes to 64 AND gates. It, it derives 64 AND gates, so the load will be significant. And besides, this will be a long wire, goes from one end of the design to the other end that introduces additional latency. So in designing VLSI circuits, we try to avoid both of these undesirable effects, having long wires and having a large fan out. So let's see if we can get rid of the long wire and the fan out problem. So this is known as a semi-systolic if we don't have any long wires and we don't have any fan out, the design is known as systolic design. Now, there is a systematic method for converting a non-systolic design into a systolic design. And the idea is this. If I have a circuit, such as this one, with signals experiencing some integer units of delay in going from one part of the circuit. So E is an integer, so two units of delay, let's say. F is an integer, let's say three units of delay. And those units of delay correspond basically to flip-flops on the path. Okay, if this is the case, and I have units of delay, certain number of units of delay, for signals going from one side of the circuit to the other, and similarly for signals going in the opposite direction. And there are also inputs, primary inputs and primary outputs. Then one thing I can do is to cut the circuit through that dotted line. And then I can basically further delay these inputs going from left to right by the constant D. So in other words, if there were E flip-flops on this pad, I add D more. So I delay those signals by D additional unit. And I advance these other signals by D units. So if both of these numbers are greater than D, then I can subtract D from them. So basically, these signals go from right to left later than they used to in the circuit. And these signals go from left to right earlier than they used to. And similarly, everything that goes into this part of the circuit 
input is delayed by D, including primary input. And everything that goes out of this part of the circuit is advanced by D units, including primary output. And then the claim is that this circuit externally functions exactly as before. So these added and subtracted delays do not affect the external behavior of the circuit. And the reason is pretty obvious. So let's consider the time at which the signal arrives, okay? Compared to this signal. So there are E plus D units of delay there, certain amount of delay inside the circuit, and then plus G minus D units of delay. So add all of these up, E plus D plus G will be E plus G plus whatever delay I have here. And that's exactly the delay I had here, E plus G plus whatever delay the circuit introduces internally. Okay, so as far as the interaction between these two halves is concerned and the external behavior of the circuit, this does not cause any changes. Okay, so this is another way of looking at it, a different diagram showing the same thing. If I have a delay of D on this signal pad, D1, and a delay of D2 on this signal pad, I can basically take this delay D1, remove it from there, basically reduce that by D1, and increase that by D1. And this circuit behaves in the same way. Or I can do just the opposite. I can start with this circuit and then transfer D1 units of delay from here to here. Now, zero delay paths are basically things that we try to avoid in systolic circuits. Because if you have multiple zero delay paths, basically what, what was wrong with this design is this zero delay paths. Zero, zero, cascaded with each other. If I put latches here so that these are unit delay paths, then I won't have long wires and I won't have fan out problem, okay? So basically in systolic circuits, I try to avoid zero delay paths. So if I have this situation, I basically remove some delay from another path, bring it here so that now both paths here have non-zero delays. Okay, so I can apply this principle to this circuit, okay? I want to avoid these zero delay paths. Okay, what can I do? Well, take this section, this cut through the circuit, and when I cut the circuit, I can remove the delay from this and put it up there. So I remove the delay from this line and put it up there, and it shouldn't affect the operation of the circuit. Similarly, I remove this delay and put it up there. I remove this delay and put it up there. So this circuit basically accomplishes exactly the same thing, but in the circuit I've avoided both the long wire and also the fan out problem because each of these flip-flops just drives one gate, okay? It doesn't have a fan out problem. However, in doing so, I've introduced another problem. I now have zero delay paths in this chain. So I fixed that path, but introduced a problem in this path. So basically, the clock cycle must be wide enough for signals to propagate through all of these full adders and then affect this flip-flop, okay? So I fixed one thing, but messed up another thing. So what's the solution? Well, a possible solution is to double up these delays. So basically purposely slow down the circuit by inputting a new bit every other clock cycle, 
rather than on every clock cycle. And put two latches here, two latches here, so that during that idle cycle where there's no new input, basically the contents of this is transferred to this one, and the contents of this is transferred to the doubled up, the, the second. Now I can remove one of these flip-flops or latches and move it there. One of these, move it there. And now there is no zero delay path in this design. And it's completely systolic. So I've removed all the long paths, the original long path up here, and the long path in the second design that was here. Neither of those exist. But the price that I pay is that I need twice as many clock cycles for the serial input. Okay? And uh, basically, the silver lining is that although I have twice as many clock cycles, each of those cycles will be extremely short because within one cycle, all I have to do is basically the critical path in one cycle goes through an AND gate, through a full adder, affecting these two latches. Okay, there are no long wires, there's no signal propagation, and therefore the clock cycle can be extremely short. And therefore, even though I have twice as many clock cycles, the net effect may be a speed up in the operation of the circuit. So this is a fully systolic multiplier but it's still not what I started pursuing. I, I wanted a fully bit serial multiplier where both inputs come in bit serially. And this isn't it. Okay. So this is now the design of an actual bit serial multiplier. So here are the two inputs, A and X. This, these are the partial products that we need to form and combine. At some given point in the bit serial process, I've already received and processed a bunch of bits of A, a bunch of bits of X, and I'm now looking at AI and XI, which are the next pair of bits coming in in the bit serial multiplier, okay? Having received these bits highlighted in yellow, I've also formed these bits, okay, highlighted in yellow because those bits are basically the product of these two. Now, when I receive these two new bits, I need to form their product, which is this bit. I need to form AI times the previous bit of X. That's the number. And I have to form xi times the previous bit of a, and that's that number. So basically, I now need to form one more layer of bits in this matrix, because I now can form them, given that I know these two bits. OK, now let's assume, now, uh, up to this point, I've also produced, uh, in this example, five bits of the product. So portions of these values represented by the yellow dots here has already been output. But this output is less than the sum of these values. Okay? In particular, that output does not include any bit in this position, in this position, in this position. So there is a residual or leftover from these bits that is not reflected in the output produced that far, thus far. And let's say that residual value is represented as three numbers. So a form of redundant representation. So these three numbers shown there collectively represent the residual, the difference between the values of these dots and the value of the dots that have already been produced at the output. So though that residual must be added to those two 5-bit numbers, these two, 
and then to this one bit. So I have to do a 5 to 3 reduction. And I can do that quite easily by 5-3 counters. Okay, so 5 bits, these are the 3 output bits. 5 bits, these are the 3 output bits. And then after I do this, I have to right shift. When I right shift, this one bit here drops out as the next output bit. So it basically becomes this next bit of the output. And the remaining bits right shifted become the residual for the next step. Okay, so everything works out perfectly. There are some details that I did not discuss. I leave it up to you to study these diagrams and figure out how they work. Uh, but intuitively, uh, it's clear that this can be done. So basically, I've already processed these bits, and I've already emitted these outputs. So the leftover bits, the leftover value from those bits is represented internally here. And the new numbers to be added are added. Reduction from 5 to 3 takes place. A right shift occurs that leads to this bit being output. And the remaining bits to be kept. OK, so these three bits that are produced by the 5 to 3 counter, one is the sum bit, one is carry into the next position. One is carry into two positions higher. But because we immediately right shift everything, okay, instead of the sum being kept in the same position, the sum is sent to the right. The carry is kept in place, and the carry two position up is sent there. So this is what's happening here. This is the sum, which is sent to the right. This is the carry into the next higher position, which due to right shift is kept in place into this register. And this is the carry into two positions higher that goes to the next position after right shift. OK, so let's um, basically consider this discussion done, although some details here have not been explained by me. OK, modular multipliers basically are multipliers that form the product modulo a certain number. Again, modulo to the k is simple. You just ignore the carry out. Modulo to the k minus 1. So basically, I have to form this product of 4 by 4 numbers. And then reduce modulo 15, let's say. I'm doing modulo 15. OK, so the weight of these positions are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Because 16 is 1 modulo 15, I can transfer these three dots to this column without affecting the modulo 15 result. I can transfer these two dots, 32 modulo 15 is 2, I can transfer them here. And 64 modulo 15 is 4. can transfer that dot here. So basically, as I form these partial products, I put these dots not where I've shown them here, but inside this triangle there. And then I add these. Okay. How do I add four numbers modulo 15? I do modulo 15 carry save adder, in which the carry out is reinserted at the least position. Then another modulo 15 carry save adder. And finally, a modulo 15 carry propagate adder, which involves an end around carry. So modulo to the k minus 1 multiplication is simple. I basically form uh, the partial products in the usual way, except I transfer these dots from the left end to the right end. And then I do carry save modulo to the k minus 1 carry save 
addition and modulo to the k minus 1 addition. Now more generally, I need a, a more sophisticated scheme. And this slide, which I leave up to you to read, um, contains uh, some ideas. In order to do, say, modulo 13, 13 is not a simple number like 15. So, OK, I have to, it takes more doing to achieve modulo 13 multiplication. Uh, the special case of squaring, when you square a number, you're basically multiplying that number by itself, x multiplied by itself. So I basically do the same thing as in multiplication, form all the partial products. But now I note that x0 times x0 is just x0, right? If x0 is 0, then this is 0. If x0 is 1, this is 1. So that can be simplified to x0. Similarly, x1 times x1, x2 times x2. Then I have x0 times x1 and x1 times x0. Those two are identical terms. So instead of having two terms in this column, I put one copy of that term in the next higher column. Because this column is worth twice as much, two copies of something in this column is the same as one copy in that column. And I do the same thing. So the partial products uh, matrix is simplified from a height of 5, in the case of multiplication of 5 by 5 numbers, to a height of 3. So that's why I mentioned at the beginning that uh, uh, squaring is a simpler operation than multiplication. So here I just need to do a carry save addition and then a regular addition to finish the product to compute the final uh, square. And there are some further simplifications can I do, uh, I can do that I won't discuss here. Now in the case of a square using the divide and conquer or recursive method, similar simplifications occur. I'm multiplying this number by itself. So I have XL times XL xh times xl and xh times xl, so two copies of the same thing. And then xh times xh, so that's xl times xl, xh times. And these two copies, instead of having two copies, I just shift one of the copies to the left by one bit. And again, instead of three rows, I have just two rows to combine. These two components are as in multiplication. These two components are combined by shifting one of them to the left to double it, basically. So again, so what are the components that I need for this? I need a square, a half width square, another half width square, and a half width multiplier to form this number. Okay, the final topic is combine, multiply, add units. So it's often the case that when we multiply two numbers, we want to add the result, the product, to a running total. So this is done, for example, when we do inner products. We compute individual product terms and then add them together. So each product term is added to a running total. So here is uh, an idea. So I do the multiplier, the carry save adder tree of the multiplier that leads to two numbers. But I don't add these two as I would do in a normal multiplier. I add these two to that running total the additive input by using a carry save addition and then a regular addition. So if I did the multiplication in full first and then added the additive input, I would need an addition here with carry propagation and then a second addition with carry propagation. Whereas by doing it this way, I have the carry save adder tree. 
I have one carry save addition, which is pretty fast. And I have uh, a carry propagate addition, just one carry propagate addition. So that saves uh, time because I replaced two carry propagate addition by a single carry propagate addition. Now this additive input can be the same width as uh, my operands, or it can be wider. Often it is wider so that when we add these things together, you know, the exact sum can be maintained without losing, uh, you know, without encountering overflow. Okay, so here's the second idea. Suppose I keep that running total in carry safe form. So I'm trying to avoid even that one carry propagate addition. So if I keep the running total in carry safe form, so there are two numbers representing the running total, and there are two numbers coming out of the CSA tree in the multiplier, I have to add these four things together. So I need two levels of carry save addition. That's it, because the running total is kept in carry save form. So I can keep adding various terms to this running total without doing any carry propagate addition, except in the very last step when I'm done with all the multiplies and accumulations, and then then I can. Only then I convert this uh, carry save uh, number into an ordinary binary number. So I have just one carry propagate addition at the very end of the process. I can do hundreds of multiplications and accumulations and only one carry propagate addition at the very end. Okay, I can also insert the additive input as part of the multiplication. Rather than first have a carry save adder tree for the multiplier and then combining the additive input, I can just insert the additive input, in this case in non redundant form, and directly combine it with all those partial products. Or if the carry save additive input is in carry save form, if the additive input is in carry save form, then those two will be added to the partial product from the multiplication. Okay, so these are variations on combining the multiplication with addition into a single operation. And nowadays in floating point units in particular, uh, floating multiply add is a common operation because it's so useful that we actually implement it directly in hardware. FMA, floating multiply add, takes three numbers, multiplies two of them together, and adds the third number to the result. Okay, that's uh, basically the end of uh, uh, this chapter, and in fact the end of this part on multiplication. Uh, and I'll see you again uh, when we start our discussion of division. We will see that division is actually a much more difficult operation than even multiplication. So it's actually probably the most challenging part of the book and of this course, uh, trying to understand division algorithms. We'll start on that next time. Uh, bye.